Hello, welcome to the asynchronistic lecture. So watch this lecture and then um, do your discussion form assignment. I wanted to um, first say that when I started lecturing last class, that was a lot of lecture and I'll try and keep it shorter than that. But also I'm not sure, I'm trying to figure out how to lecture over Zoom better um, given that I think it's a little, probably a little harder for me to ask questions and get a back and forth going. So if you want to just put questions for me or comments about how I can do what works, what doesn't work, um, if that worked for you, if it didn't work for you, on the discussion board where it says questions for instructor, that would be really helpful for me to make sure that I'm lecturing in a way that's good for you guys, that's helping you all grapple with the course materials. And that'll kind of give us a way of doing some continual feedback, um, hopefully to get your needs met better. On that same note, if there, you have questions for me that come up over the course of this lecture, or if you have questions that come up from the readings that are for me, feel free to post that in the discussion form that says questions for instructor and, uh, instructor, and I'll be reading that and I'll um, respond to that. So last class, we were talking about um, what is anthropology, right? And one of the kinds of key things we saw was that in Boazian anthropology, you see this core concept of culture that's really central to the discipline emerges. And in many ways, we see this idea of culture as being under, as understood in contrast to biology. For example, where we talk about animals having instincts, um, we say humans have culture, not instincts. Now, I think that's probably a little flat because I think it doesn't do justice to the complexity of animal life, but that was a common kind of dichotomy that was made for many decades. That was how I was taught this material. Um, so anyway, whether it's in the context of saying differences, social difference are not driven by biology or racial categories, but rather by cultural differences like Boaz, or gender roles reflect cultural um, assumptions, cultural roles, as opposed to a biological difference between men and women, right? Like Margaret Mead said, we see this move over and over again. Culture is different than biology. And a lot of these kinds of social inequalities that we see are assumptions about human nature or human difference, these assumptions are cultural ideologies in nature, not in the inherent functions of human nature. So in this class, I was going to talk more about, give you guys some definitions, uh, core definitions of, for anthropologists and how we do research. I'm gonna share screen. And in particular, we're looking at culture, the definitions of culture, cultural relativism, and um, ethnocentrism. So here's the objectives are really to define these concepts for you. And I just want to note up front that these are technical terms in anthropological usage. They're going to be a little different than maybe the ways you um, hear these terms in common usage outside of anthropology. So just be prepared that you may think you know what these terms mean, but I'm using technical definitions here. What is culture? We've talked about culture a lot over the past couple weeks. Um, who knows? Uh, just kidding, there, there's more to it than that. There's hundreds of definitions used by different anthropologists that have been created over the last uh, century. And no one really agrees about what culture means. Everyone has a somewhat different definition. So that's what I mean, like really, who knows? What is culture? But the truth of the matter is that actually as anthropologists, we're not super concerned with abstract definitions like this. Like we're, the question of what is culture is really actually not super interesting. What we're more interested in instead is what do actual concrete cultural differences and experiences look like? Um, not culture in the abstract, but culture in the concrete in specific instances. And we're more concerned, right, when we, we see an abstract definition, like what is culture or what is anything, 
our first thought as anthropologists is to say, okay, but who's being left out of that defin definition? What's being obscured here? So again, we're actually not super, some students say like, oh, anthropologists don't even have a formal definition of culture. Like, what a shitty fucking discipline, right? That's not really the point here. Um, we have many definitions. They're good for illuminating different things. Um, I think of them as working definitions, but none of them are perfect. No definition is perfect. And ultimately, as anthropologists, we're really interested where in the moments in which definitions start falling apart and they stop working and our existing models just fall apart. So let's start by saying, what is culture not? This is actually a good anthropological move whenever you try and identify something. What is something? Well, what is it not? So one common assumption that you see over and over again in the, Uni in the United States, right, is um, culture is basically kind of like a layer cake. And unfortunately, um, this white on white isn't working very well. But what I've tried to do here, right, is I've made several layers where you have biology at the bottom, psychology, economics, politics, and then culture is the ice. And the idea in this model, right, is that there's something real in the world, which is biology and to a lesser extent, the human mind, then economy. And culture is basically a bunch of cute fluff that's flopped on top of it. Um, interesting, cute, but not necessarily significant in the kind of way that biology is understood to be real um, or psychology is understood to be real. Within this layer cake model, um, often the idea is that each tier is kind of based on the preconditions of the other one. So psychology is based within biology and economics is governed by these kinds of inherent rules of human psychology. Politics is governed by these inherent rules of economics and so forth. Now the problem here for anthropologists is it just doesn't work this way. Culture is not just fluff on top of some kind of more fundamentally real reality. Culture is the system of frameworks and concepts and categories that we use to apprehend reality. So when we look at, for example, biology, I'll just go back to this previous one, culture is our, our ideas about what is biology. It's the way we do biological research. It's our ideas about what is the nature of the human mind. It's how we do psychological research. It's the assumptions and frameworks that guide how we move about the world. So culture is actually the whole thing, more or less. I mean, culture isn't biology, but it's certainly the way we understand biology. Another kind of common misconception is that culture is basically a row of ethnic foods, an ethnic food restaurants. You know, you have a Chinese restaurant, you have a Indian restaurant, you have a, um, what other kinds of restaurants are there? You have a Turkish restaurant in this picture, you have a Hawaiian restaurant, and you can kind of imagine this row of different restaurants or this row of different cultures that are all kind of neat and state of themselves. Another kind of way of thinking about this is a museum exhibit, right, where you have like the um, Inuit exhibit, or you have the um, whatever exhibit, China or India exhibit, right? And the mistake here, right, is we have, we imagine people in these kinds of bounded glassed off displays or exhibits, right? But maybe they're looking at one another and saying, you know, I'd actually like to visit India or I'm gonna move to China. I think that'd be a good place to live because that's what people do, right? So culture is not like a row of ethnic food restaurants. Culture is not like cake. It's not fluff that sits on top of the kind of real shit. Instead, culture is the complex whole that, view, that, sh that shapes our view of the world and it shapes our practices. It's our view of nature. It's our view of economic and political processes. And it's those views that we often take for granted or assume are natural or normal. Culture is not like a row of ethnic restaurants, ethnic food restaurants. So for example, it doesn't adhere within discrete self-contained units like the walls of a building 
Culture is fluid and dynamic. It's always changing and moving. Culture is also not a kind of ordered variation within preconceived types, right? Like in the way you have the type is a restaurant and then you have the different types, which are the ethnic restaurants, which are, you know, as I said, Chinese, Indian, Hawaiian, etc. Instead, we can actually think about culture as the overarching model of difference. Culture is not the different types of restaurant, it's the institution of restaurants in themselves. It's the social organization of having a row of ethnic re food restaurants. And it's the assumption that certain kinds of restaurants are ethnic food, while other kinds of restaurants are just like normal food, I guess. So again, culture, are, can, culture is the frameworks that we use to order, categorize, and act within the world. Oh, I have here culture as the public health department that checks on these different restaurants, right? Culture is all the things we take for granted. Culture is the system by which we order these differences, like the type of Chinese food, the type of Indian food, et cetera. So now that I've said a little bit about what culture is not, I can say a little bit about some different definitions that anthropologists have proposed for what culture is. So a kind of classical definition, what is culture? It's the sum total of learned behavior and beliefs. Basically, everything humans learn over the course of their lifetime. Customs, habits, practices, belief systems. Um, another definition that you often see is an older one that comes out of Edward B. Tyler's work, which is that culture is the complex whole which includes knowledge, belief, art, morals, law, custom, custom, and any other capacities and habits acquired by man as a member of society. Now, of course, we can see his um, ethnocentrism and androcentrism, his centering of men and not um, other genders in his definition. But what's useful about this definition, right, is again, this language of acquired. It's everything that's acquired by a person by virtue of their membership in society. It's the things they learn. This also means, of course, that culture is, because culture is learned behavior, right? Um, it's not something that, in, it's not inherent. It's not something like, um, an example a friend of mine always gives, like is, it's kind of obvious, right? But if you adopt a American baby, and they grow up in China, they're going to learn and be comfortable within um, whatever part of China, like Tokyo culture. Ooh, I'm sorry about that with Hong Hong culture. Maybe I should just fucking start over. We're gonna keep going. Sometimes I get a little anxious and I will word vomit the wrong thing and it'll be a stupid mistake like that, but hopefully I will catch myself. Another good definition is Clifford Gertz, who says a, um, culture is a symbol, a web of symbols. And we're constantly creating and interpreting these symbols. And so an example of this right for ex um, would be dogs, right? When I say dog, that's a symbol for a particular animal and you think of, when I say it, you probably have an image of that animal in your head. Now there's also a whole elaboration of what dogs mean within our culture. For example, we say somebody might be in the dog house or they might work like a dog. There's, uh, or um, they might be loyal. Um, if some, that might be a virtue associated with dogs or playful. There's this whole kind of web of symbolism associated with dogs. Now, symbols are also defined by the things that they're not. So for example, dogs are not cats. And in fact, we have a whole cultural elaboration of the difference between dogs and cats. Um, are you a dog person or are you a cat person? In some ways, this often gets conflated with like gender differences where cat people are like more feminine or something like that. It's very complicated. So all of these symbols are in many ways, many of these symbols are arbitrary. Um, I, we talk about, and they're, but they're also intertwined and related. 
to make sense of any one symbol, you have to understand it in the context of all the under, other symbols. What is a dog not? What is its relationship to any other kind of symbol? Here's one of my favorite definitions of culture. This was given to me by a friend of mine who was quoting their introduction to anthropology professor. And they said, culture is everything you consider natural and normal. I just love that. It's succinct. If you think it's normal, if you think it's natural, that's your culture. So going back, for example, to the ethnic food restaurants, right? Culture isn't the row of ethnic restaurants. Um, it's not the different types of ethnic restaurants. Culture is the system that we take for granted. Um, it's what we consider normal and natural, which is the row of different kinds of restaurants itself. When I went and did the first, um, in the previous lecture where I was talking about the organization of different departments in the university, I said, you know, these departments were created in the, um, 1900s for the most part, late 1800s and early 1900s, as a way of defining and categorizing the world and breaking it down into smaller pieces and analyzing those pieces individually. So, um, and I said that we often conflate these disciplines then with real things that exist in the world, but instead it's, we can think about the disciplines as actually reflecting a cultural framework in its own right. We can, it, re, it reflects a system of categories. A system of categories that we use to interpret the world. And we're constantly interpreting and making meaning in the world. And the truth is without culture, we can't act in the world, right? Because the amount of information that our brains have to process without doing this kind of categorizing work is just astronomical, right? Um, you can interact with a computer or a Mac computer in a much easier way than, for example, an assemblage of molecules. Okay, so here are some good definitions of culture. I really love this, everything you consider natural and normal. Again, when we say if something is biological, right, often we're saying we consider it natural and normal. When you hear, for example, um, turf saying, oh, it's just biology for men and women to be different, right? Actually, if you look at biological science, the science is actually quite more complex. We won't get into that right now, um, but it's very interesting. But instead, it's the ideas of what we consider a biological reality, what we consider normal and natural is a cultural set of ideologies, a cultural set of beliefs. So here's a pro tip for having these conversations, yeah? I often, and I'll challenge you to do this in our conversations um, in class, avoid using culture or cultures as a noun. Now, I've had to use culture as a noun in these introductory lectures because it's very hard to talk about these kinds of general concepts without doing that. I'm not going to continue doing that. And as things kind of progress, I will go to what is, feels more comfortable to me at this point, which is using cultural as an adjective. For example, um, we can talk about cultural beliefs, cultural practices, cultural processes, cultural relationships. What I like about that is we can't say this culture versus that culture, which is really kind of um, counter-generative. We'll get more into that. Instead, we can talk about cultural concepts or cultural practices in a way that doesn't necessarily force us to draw these kinds of neat boundaries between different cultures, because those boundaries are ultimately fictions. One of the things that came up in the readings, right, is this idea of universals versus particulars. Um, one of the authors was very interested in this idea that Shakespeare would be, the beauty of Shakespeare would be a universal given in society. And she found, of course, that that just wasn't true at all that um, the text of Shakespeare, the story had to be adapted to a new cultural context before it would make sense in any kind of basic way. And as an anthropologist, one of the things that we say, right, is universals are universally boring. 
if we talk about what are human universals, there are going to be things like humans speak language. Humans um, have music. They make music or art. Um, they have humans bury their dead with some kind of ceremony, right? Which is actually a little more interesting, but not super interesting. Because the interesting things are not these generalizations, which are so vague that they're like, there's not really much to say there. Instead, what's interesting are the particulars. How does people, how do people speak? How do people bury their dead? How do people um, create art or literature or stories or um, music? And once we start asking those questions, we start getting into the particularities of culture. And again, one of the kinds of core moves we do in anthropology over and over again is to say, how do the particularities of human experience challenge our preconceived notions of human nature, of what we had assumed wrongly to be universals? One of the things, this is kind of a side note, I love about the Shakespeare in the Bush article is that one of the kinds of things that didn't come across in the translation is really the concept of a king um, in the kind of European historical sense. And this is, goes back to the idea, right, that culture is a system of symbols, a web of interconnected symbols. One of the things that elders in this community had trouble translating was the idea of this person who was this sovereign absolute authority who could do things like levy taxes and um, didn't have, for example, didn't have to farm. Um, so like one of some of the things they say, right, is like, oh, you shouldn't levy taxes because then people won't like you. You should give people things because then they'll respect your leadership and they'll want to follow you. Or they say, well, how could the king have um, feed all of the guests without having many wives? And that was this whole explanation, right? Because the idea was that everyone farms. There's no one who doesn't farm or somehow produce their own food within this community, right? And the idea of someone who lived off of the labors of others was not very straightforward. Um, that was not something that they could be taken for granted. Um, and as a result, right, the idea is like, well, of course, they need a family large enough to be able to produce and prepare enough food for guests, um, as opposed to a king in the European tradition, which is someone who collects taxes and then pays for servants. Um, and some of that taxes include, for example, grains and foodstuffs. So the idea of this absolute authority just like was not irrelevant, that made no cultural sense. And then that was tied to all of these ideas about what's a proper, who is properly part of your family, what's your proper responsibilities and needs when, um, for example, your um, someone dies, when your um, husband dies, what should you do? Those things didn't translate over. And it's this whole web of symbols that have to do with who's counted as your family, what are power relations, what do those look like? Um, those kinds of things. And so all of these things are particulars, um, cultural particulars that made what the author had originally thought would be the universal beauty of Shakespeare. Um, it just didn't translate. The next definition I want to cover is ethnocentrism. This, these next two definitions are going to be a little simpler. Ethnocentrism is a technical anthropological con concept in this context, and it basically just means evaluating other people's cultures based on the standards of your own. Now, again, I've fallen into the trap of using culture as a noun, but forgive me for the sake of this introductory lecture. Um, and so if you look at the root word of ethnocentrism, right, ethnos basically means culture or the, a group of people with certain customs. So ethnocentrism is really putting your own culture at the center of analysis. It's taking your own cultural frameworks and assumptions um, for granted as normal and natural and then applying them to other people's societies, to other people's lives. <clears throat> 
Now, this isn't necessarily a moral flaw when anthropologists talk about it. Like, um, I think in common, common conversation, when people say that's ethnocentric, it's seen as a kind of, there's a negative connotation that they're doing something morally bad. And that's fair, and I don't have a problem with that. But in this particular context of anthropology, we're actually using ethnocentrism to talk about an analytical flaw. It's a flaw in how someone understands cultural difference or different societies. So basically when I talk about ethnocentrism, there's not an in, a level of inherent moral weight to, do, to ethnocentrism. It's just a flaw in your reasoning. Cultural relativism then is the opposite of ethnocentrism. And this is really the cornerstone of anthropological analysis. This is like the very core groundwork of doing good anthropology. And the idea is to use culture, to analyze something, to analyze something in a way that is culturally relativistic. It means we have to, we have to understand culture only on their own terms and within its own context not within the terms of our own assumptions and preconceived beliefs. Um, and so there's a set of questions, right, that we ask, right? How do these ideas or practices that we're learning about, how do they make sense within other people's cultural wor worlds? How do other people, why does this activity or why does this belief system make sense to people? How do we understand what makes it make sense? And then what are the standards and values of that culture? And how might these be different from your own? So in order to do this, right, we have to temporarily at least suspend our judgment about what's good or bad or right or wrong. Because again, the aim is to understand other people within their own cultural standards and values. So for example, in Death Without Weeping, right, you could say, wow, not feeding or n neglecting newly born children, that's, that's wrong, that's immoral. But what you would have failed to understand then is why women in this context are failing, are, are not failing, that's already an ethnocentric framing. Why women in this context are doing this, why they are making these decisions and make, and you know, thinking about the kinds of real, including economic, um, decisions that people are forced to make in really horrific ways. But, you know, the idea, right, is to understand why these practices make sense to them. And we have to understand the whole, the whole cultural and social context to make sense of these kinds of actions. So again, this goes back to the point from last lecture. Anthropology is about looking at cultural wholes. Um, it also goes back to, um, well, I forgot the other thing it goes back to. Ah, the idea that culture is not like a layer cake, because of course, economics, um, economic reality is also a part of our cultural reality. Now, one thing I want to do, I do want to note here, right, is, well, actually, let me give you another example. I have a really good example of cultural relativism. So in my own research, I work with the Muscogee Creek tribe in the U.S. South. And in the 70s, there's a story, right, where in the 70s, this person invited a reporter to come to this important ceremony. And this reporter, she came and what she saw was that women who were menstruating were not allowed to participate in ceremony. And then she saw that women were cooking while men were doing the ceremony and that men then ate first while women ate afterwards. And she got really upset, right? Because she said, this is a bunch of sexism. And um, she got really mad. And when people talk of, in this community talk about this, and the way I've had elderly women explain this to me is that she just didn't really understand the cultural context, which was, if a woman is menstruating, that means she's really close to creator. That means, because women are, people who can give birth are considered co-creators. They create life. And so when you're menstruating, you are flowing with power. You are just, your body is just um, doing something really powerful. And the problem there, right, is power 
can be very dangerous. For example, a, a um, 18 wheeler has a lot of power. It can haul a lot of goods, but if you get hit by one, that's gonna be really bad. So in a, the same way, right, to have someone who is so full of power could be potentially dangerous. And so she shouldn't necessarily participate in ceremony. She should have other people caring for her needs while she kind of stays um, in a separate space. And if you go back several hundred years ago, that separate space was actually a hut that was shared by all women in the community. And it was a space where women actually gathered during their minces. And, um, you know, it was kind of this center of women's governance, of women's political power, because it was a space where they all got together and made decisions. Now, in terms of not dancing, the idea is because women are co-creators, because they menstruate, they don't need ceremony. Men need ceremony or people who don't menstruate, because that also includes, in recent history, people with vaginas who didn't menstruate. Um, but because of that, they were not, um, they don't need, they, because they don't menstruate, they didn't, they need ceremony to kind of do that same work. So when community members talk about this idea of separation between men and women um, within ceremony, it is, um, they talk about it in very different ways that this reporter kind of didn't understand, she missed. And so whether you say, and now whether Muscogee Creek women say like, this is good or bad, or this is a patriarchal society or matriarchal society, there's tons of debate, you know, there's all kinds of debate and it's different in different communities, different, different peoples have different practices, even within the Muscogee Nation. Um, but the fundamental assumption of looking at this and saying, oh, this is patriarchy because this woman is menstruating and can't dance in ceremony, well, that kind of misses the bigger cultural context. And that actually, um, instead of engaging with indigenous feminisms, instead universalizes white feminisms, white feminist goals and objectives, and holds them to be the universal standard upon which all societies can be judged. So that's a kind of example of cultural relativism. Now I wanna to say too, cultural relativism is not the same as moral relativism. Cultural relativism is a methodology. It is a framework that we use to understand on an analytical level, different human cultures and societies. Moral relativism is a different idea, right? Which is the idea that all cultural practices, um, all pra really all practices are, ha um, are everything goes, right? Um, everything, you can only judge the morality of an action based in its own context, and so everything thus is equally mo moral. Now, the problem, I, the way I explain this distinction between cultural relativism and moral relativism is, for example, what if you're an anthropologist and you study a group of neo-Nazis? Now, you don't have to say neo-Nazis are morally okay because you're an anthropologist. In fact, that would not be very good anthropology. Um, but at the same time, if you actually wanted to do an anthropological study of neo-Nazis, your goal would be to understand the world from their perspective. And maybe that is a useful goal even within anti-racist activities. Um, maybe it's not, uh, that's another topic for another day. But an, a, the anthropological approach would say, how do neo-Nazis make sense of the world from their own perspectives? Um, and how do we understand neo-Nazi ideologies um, as they exist, as, as they interact among actual neo-Nazis? And to do that, you need to adopt a cultural relativistic position. Because if you don't, all you can say is that neo-Nazis are bad. And that's true. I don't have a problem with that. But it's not very interesting and you don't need to do a whole research project you don't need to get grant money and spend public money, for example, to tell me that neo-Nazis are bad. That's just like not a good, that's just not good anthropology. That's not worth the research because we already knew it. Why do research on something we already knew? So that's all to say that cultural relativism 
is not necessarily the same as moral relativism. And when I say we need to be culturally relativistic as anthropologists, I'm not saying anything goes and everything's okay. So what is cultural anthropology? Coming back to this question from last week, cultural anthropology is the study of the complex whole of symbolic worlds, social relationships, and interconnections that make us human. And as a discipline, cultural anthropology is historically oriented towards the study of colonized, indigenous, black, people of color, and it retains to this day an emphasis on privileging the life worlds and perspectives of marginalized peoples. How does, pe how does Nancy Shepard Hughes help us understand um, the world we live in as she studies mothering practices? Um, how does um, the Shakespeare in a Bush article, how does that help us understand our own ideas about what is human nature or what is universal? What is a human universal? So how do these kinds of perspectives from the margin help us understand the whole of our world better or more thoroughly? And that's where we're gonna pick up next week. I have some questions for the forum. Um, you can find, you can download the PowerPoint and if you need to see these for longer, but think about how do these readings demonstrate the concept of cultural relativism or ethnocentrism? Um, what might be an ethnocentric interpretation of these materials? And then how does that fall short? What kind of contextual information do we need to understand these phenomena within their own cultural context? And if anything surprised you, write about that. That's always a good concept, a good context, uh, a good discussion. I also expect some of you may have had things that were pretty hard to swallow, right? So like, are we supposed to be culturally relativistic about babies dying? For example, in Death Without Weeping. Um, and maybe that's hard for you to swallow. And so just like, you know, take this as a chance to kind of work through those problems because I don't think there are easy answers. And as an anthropologist, I'm not interested in easy answers. I'm interested, interested in questions that help us, that push us to go deeper in our understanding of the world. And if there's an easy answer, it wasn't a very good question. All right, I'll see you guys on Thursday. If you have any questions or need clarification, um, I'm sorry, I'll see you guys on Wednesday. If you have clarification questions, put those in the um, discussion form, uh, questions for instructor discussion form, and I will answer them. Oh, before I go, this is something I found for another class. And I just wanted to show you guys, because I thought this was so neat, right? This is a map of Cherokee land in um, circa 1805. This is the state of Georgia, this gray area right here. And I always think it's useful to see these old maps, right, that don't have, for example, the borders of the states that we take for granted, Georgia, Florida, Alabama, and instead teach us to see the world in different ways. In this case, what are the river routes that connected different um, Muscogee Creek towns, as well as the kind of just small nature of Georgia as it existed 200 years ago, that looks very different from the Georgia we know today. As I said earlier, anthropology, I'm not anthropology, culture is everything we take for granted, everything that we consider normal. All right, see you guys on next class. Bye.